Nichtsdestotrotz ähm, geht es bei uns digital weiter. Meine Kollegen stehen hier schon in den Startlöchern. Äh, es geht um Web3 im Sport, wie Rechtehalter neue Fan-Experiences schaffen und natürlich damit auch neue digitale Märkte erobern wollen. Ist das vielleicht der Schlüssel? Und das diskutiert jetzt Dr. Andreas Jens mit seinen Gästen. Herzlich willkommen. Damit überlasse ich die Bühne euch, denn ihr habt viel zu besprechen. Vielen Dank. Bitte. So, I switched to English now. Um, it's a great pleasure to host this panel. We got really interesting, thrilly, thrilling 30 minutes in front of us. Um, just a brief introduction to the panelists. Um, first of all, we have uh, Mike Armstrong. Uh, Mike Armstrong is Chief Marketing Officer at Juventus Turin. He brings a unique blend of experience from uh, eSports, from Google, from broadcasting, so CPG industries. So welcome on stage, Mike. <laughs> Second, uh, really happy to have Pierre Naubert uh, on board. Pierre is 15 years in the industry, in the sports industry, he has an agency background in 2018 he joined Bundesliga where he's now um, chief marketing officer at Bundesliga International so welcome on stage Pia. <laughs> and last but not least uh, Lukas von Kranach our keynote speaker uh, Lukas is CEO and founder of One Football I recall really well we met like 12 years ago uh, when you presented I Liga since then A lot changed, I'd say. Um, you transferred iLiga to OneFootball, which now is a multi-platform fan experience, valued incredible uh, 1 billion uh, US dollars, so a unicorn. Um, so, but knowing you, I know that's not going to be the end, so I'm really curious uh, what's to come in your metaverse, so to say. Welcome on stage, Lucas. So, hello everyone, um, we're running a bit late, so I hope you're gonna enjoy these 30 minutes with these gentlemen. Mike, thanks so much for coming with me today from Milano and going back tomorrow, um, really appreciate it. Pierre, Andreas, thank you so much. Um, so before we go into the topic, um, maybe to give you a brief overview of what we do as One Football, maybe go me. What we do as One Football, um, so we're a media platform. We're serving now more than 100 million fans. And that is really the key of what we're doing, is looking at what the fan wants to experience and, want and wants to do. So, and there's a journey of a fan. And, you know, I, I hear uh, left and right, what is One Football doing now? They're moving into Web3. Web3 is an evolution for One Football. Um, it's a revolution for the internet and the market, but what we're trying to do is we want to grasp the football experience of a fan 24-7 and the whole week. So, you know, there's news, there's data, there's videos, there's life, there's daily fancy sports, there's ownership of content. And the purpose of One Football is to make this globally accessible. And by adding more and more of these revenue streams and verticals of content, um, we're building this global media platform. And the key element, and that's what we've changed a couple of years ago, is to get uh, our friends from the, the clubs and, and the German Football Association on board as shareholders, because what we want to build is the football ecosystem for and with the ecosystem, and not a platform on the back of this ecosystem, because in digital, and Mike and I, we've chatted a lot about that over the last couple of years, it's super difficult for, for clubs to grasp users. So, where's my, ah, here. here we go. No. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. Yes. So, look at these people. These are, this is the, current generation. And if we as an industry don't manage to 
understand these users and fans, we will have a massive challenge in converting these users and potential fans into customers. And that is what we stand for. So at OneFootball, every day, we're trying to understand the needs. We're trying to understand where these people are. We're trying to understand how they consume content. And for us, and that's what we're talking about today, Web3 is a massive angle into this audience because they're tech savvy. But what we need to make sure is that we don't, what we did wrong in Web1 and in Web2, is to describe it technically. You remember CD-ROM, DVD, megabytes, www, no one understands that. No one understands what an NFT is, a non-fungible token. That's the most stupid term for an amazing product. And that's the massive problem here. And because we're all technocrats, we think just because we understand it, every customer understands it. They don't. They don't care. They have gaming, eSports, Netflix, Spotify, football, and sports are not the only thing on planet Earth anymore. That's why we have a 78 billion piracy problem, because no one is serving the needs of these customers. And this is what we want to do. So, and now everyone says, oh, NFT and blockchain is also complicated. No one wants that shit. It's super, oh my goodness. It's the same. We're just fulfilling the needs of what was happening before. I'm a massive Cologne fan. I have so many scars, jerseys, collectibles from my club, which I have at home, and I'm super proud. Who of you have, was in a stadium at a match, took a video and sent it to friends? Saying like, I'm here. And that's possible. But the thing is, it's uncontrolled. And that's what Web2 was, that's the big massive problem. You don't, you're not in the position to verify content. And you're not in the position to own content. That's why centralized experiences like Spotify, Netflix, Facebook, no, 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 got into existence. And the challenge is that they were misusing, if I may say, their position. Because actually it's a good thing when you centralize content, but if you centralize customer ownership and put pressure on B2B, then you're running into a problem. And, the, and now with Web3, and that's the most simple explanation of what it is, is you see these, all these things here on the left-hand side, right? You could own them. Imagine you, own, you, you went into a, into a shop and bought a DVD or a CD of the Beatles. You bought this physical good, it's yours. The IP still belongs to the Beatles. And then, what can you do with this uh, CD? Whatever you want. You can throw it away, you can play Frisbee, you can give it to a friend, you can borrow it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want. And it's exactly the same thing what, we, what is possible now with Web3, because you can vi verify, like the Beatles said, there's one million of these CDs, and they're available, and now we make them available, and they cost each 10, uh, 10 euros, and that's it. And piracy was impossible because producing DVDs was more expensive than the price in the, in the, in the stores. And this is what's happening now, and this is what we're now doing and starting with our friends from the Serie A, and we became main sponsors of the Serie A, of Juventus Turin, of AC Milan, of Napoli, Bergamo, and we've managed to pull it off together with them. And not just as a partner who's paying money, because the clubs now, for the first time in Italy, have understood that we're bringing value to the table. That it's not just about money, it's about moving close and getting closer to these customers. And that's the key, because these customers want to get loved. But the clubs don't know them. And that's the big problem. They always claim, yes, we have hundreds and trillions of fans, but they don't know them. So and this is a possibility to get into the young audience and get to know to the clubs. But this only works with great products. And we have now um, launched two weeks ago the first um, marketplace for football and Web3 um, with our partners from Dapper Labs, who did NBA Top Shots, who became big investors, Animoca Brands. So all the big partners in Web3 are backing this because we believe that we are in the position to build a platform which is decentralized in a decentralized environment and it's about marrying online offline and online is web 2 and web 3 but the user shouldn't see a single piece of it 
The user shouldn't see technology just benefits. And this is our product. Sound. No? Okay. No sound. So what you can see here is a product, it's a digital video moment, and this digital video moment is not only for the purpose of owning it, it's for the purpose of getting utility with it, that you with this can get access to the stadium because we have stadium access, ticket ticketing, meet and greet with players, signed jerseys, etc. And we want to build a community, and this community is here, Serie A focused, but uh, we also have secured the global rights of the German Football Association, of the um, AFA, which is the Argentinian Football Association, and there will be a massive, tremendous um, player collection will be launched around the World Cup. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, say who it is right now, um, but that's going to be super great. And again, with our friends from the DFL, from Juventus Turin, we want to build this platform and we want everyone to participate and that's um, our purpose at One Football. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Um, Mike, uh, we've heard Lucas. It's all about uh, serving the customer, understanding the customer. Um, from your perspective, what's the, the added value One Football brings to the table when it comes to your partnership? For, for Juventus, um, I mean, we're a, we're a global brand with a global fan base. And most people see us as uh, perhaps a, an Italian brand, and we're very local. The reality is 90% uh, of our audience is uh, spread out all over the world. And so within that subset, uh, there's a very um, diverse um, set of fan groups. Uh, with, uh, with One Football, with uh, Web3, we can now reach a global audience with a new offering. Um, for fans that um, want to collect, want to share, want to um, get connected to the sport that they love. Uh, and so for us, this really helps us reach a, a global population um, in, uh, in something that's really uh, um, history, uh, precedent setting. Thanks. Pierre, uh, we've heard 170 million for the, for the next cycle um, for football clubs in Germany starting 23-24. Um, one Football is one of the partners, um, together with Tops and, and so rare. So, what's the the ratio uh, behind this constellation? So, you mean the financial ratio? I think we're not going to hit on this one. But um, what's what what's our intention of? Uh, I think. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> our intention was um, when we started the discussion about how we want to go about Web3 uh, in the future, how we want to go about uh, NFTs, um, what do we want to do with that, and uh, how can we find the right partners? Uh, like roughly one year ago, we started into those kind of internal discussion. Um, we were pretty much coming up with the idea of doing a tender process uh, because we wanted to, uh, obviously, to uh, put out what we can offer, but we also wanted to understand what other market players can offer to us. And uh, you hit on the, on the numbers. Yeah, numbers are always important, but uh, for us it was uh, also, and probably at the, at the same level at the numbers, was as important as those numbers, uh, finding the right partner to help us, exactly what Mike just pointed out, and uh, Lucas in his keynote, to uh, find the possibility to uh, get access to uh, yeah, the, the, the right target group and the young target group uh, in, uh, in uh, the Web3 um, space. But all in all, in terms of the tender process, yeah, with the outcome, we are super happy. I think it was, uh, was uh, very well done uh, by, by, by the whole DFL group. Um, we found good partners, the right partners. I think we are really proud of having partners such as uh, OneFootball. And uh, it was also uh, an, uh, uh, a proof that uh, we as a DFL are one of the innovation drivers in several parts. And uh, looking at the, um, let's say, the, 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 the the general learning from the tender process was that uh, we had more than 40 uh, registrations in the tender process from more than 40 partners. 
potential partners. Uh, some really surprised us. Some were rather, you know, the, the, the no-brainers in terms of coming up to the party. And uh, the, uh, the, the way uh, different companies and different players looked at the, the overall uh, product and, and the opportunities were really interesting for us. And uh, I think they gave us a great insight of uh, what the future of this business will look like uh, today, but also in the future. Uh, Lucas, uh, we heard the, uh, the league's perspective, the club's perspective. Uh, is there a, a difference when speaking to, to leagues, uh, to clubs? So uh, what's, your, what's your view on this? D definitely, yes. Uh, the, the thing is, it's, it's more down to knowledge and ambition and expectations. And I think there's every league and every club is completely different because they're self-organized. Uh, and um, with, th with uh, some of the, the partners, it's easier. Uh, with uh, other ones, it's more difficult to get through. But um, he here, you know, we have great examples of um, having really smooth uh, process. And we have been always seen as the, you know, the underdog. And I'm very happy to remain being in that position. Maybe in 20 years, we can sit on the main stage. So, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fight for it, but um, I really appreciate the acceptance and, and the partnership approach from the Serie A and, and Juve, Juve and the other clubs and the German F Football Association, because that makes a big difference on how you can build products. Okay, and Mike, um, in Italy, me working in football, um, I know there are a lot of opinion leaders, there's fear, um, there's hesitation, um, Take us on your journey. Uh, how did you hit, did you tackle it? Um. From a Web 3.0 for us, it was uh, it was making sure that we looked at. Uh, I mean, who uh, the right partner was, uh, similar to Pierre's comment. I mean, who's got expertise, who has scale, uh, who we can trust, and who has uh, great partners like like Dapper and uh, and Amoka behind them. And so. Um, Making the leap into Web 3.0 for us, it was really important that uh, we reduced uh, risk in the process by making sure that we were partnering with the right people that uh, had a track record uh, and that we saw scale from. Because again, back to that global comment, we, we needed to have global scale. And so um, uh, I wouldn't say that we saw it as a, a big uh, leap uh, or a giant risk for us because uh, we trusted the partners that we were, we were working with. Um, certainly, um, uh, being Juventus, uh, there's there's lots of players that come to us uh, pitching uh, uh, opportunities within Web 3.0. But um, where where we were and where we are today, we uh, we wanted to make sure we were going with uh, with with trusted sources. And generally speaking, the the feedback from the fan side, um, what's your experience there? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's quite new. Like uh, the the product uh, just just launched. Um, I'd say um, if if you're a collector collector and if you uh, want to engage in that way, it's a, it's a great product. Um, I mean, uh, I was an early uh, adopter of uh, NBA Top Shot, uh, and uh, I mean the the product that's been built is uh, is is top class. And so if you go in with an expectation, it's, it's met. And so from what I've seen, just from anecdotal feedback, it's been, it's been quite positive. I think now the, the challenge is just uh, how we continue to make it uh, a mass fan product as, as much as possible. And what's your view on it, Pierre? The reception of the fan? Of the um, I would say looking at uh, the partners we're currently working with, we see a uh, huge growth. I think r roughly um, uh, still a monthly growth, uh, month on month, by uh, about 50%. So I would say the demand is significant. Um, I think it's not a lie to see uh, to say that there are certain market players or that there's certain offerings, especially I think in the UK, which probably didn't you know keep the promises. But that's I would I would say that's you know just normal in every kind of business. So therefore, uh, I would say, um, especially in the young target groups, as uh, Lucas pointed out, uh, we see significant growth, and uh, I don't see any kind of, let's say, ceiling at the moment. Lucas, um, I knew you as an entrepreneurial mind, always pushing uh, the boundaries and seeing what comes next, uh, where is the next big thing. Let's take a look in the crystal ball. What's next? 
Yeah, I think, and, and that's why I'm, I'm super proud of, of my team, you know, that we always push boundaries. Uh, I mean, we were one of the first thousand apps on iOS, one of the first on Android, one of the first actually on a smartphone. Um, TV apps on Samsung, we were the first, uh, and now we're pushing for Web3. And I think this is a very technical description of um, just going where the customer is. So, and um, I do believe um, in the metaverse, I think again, a stupid um, expression for an experience, uh, a gamified experience. And we're now saying it's the next big thing, but already, you know, Roblox and that's already like a metaverse, or even if we're on Zoom calls, that's that's the metaverse, yeah? So, but I believe um, what we're gonna see is that things get more connected because Web3 allows for decentralization. So I see a massive connection and interception between football, gaming, and Web3, um, which could lead to, um, you know, experiences which you call metaverse or gaming whatsoever where it's possible, because it's not like in Roblox, you buy something in Roblox, you keep it in Roblox, everything is in Roblox, just an as, a, as an example, that you, it's possible really to take goods from left to right. So you buy a digital collectible that unleashes the possibility to have a skin in a game with the player you have acquired, and it, it's actually part of building a community, and that's the main goal. And um, that's why I think the whole digital collectible part with blockchain is very much perceived as a not money printing machine, but um, uh, I think that's the wrong way to look at it, because I say build a great experience first and money follows experiences, because then you get customers hooked. So I believe it's this connection, I would also put fashion in there, so that you have football, fashion, blockchain and gaming, and that things get more and more connected and that they're hopefully in future in the next 15, 20 years, that the, decentral that the centralized experiences will be decentralized and that users will own their own data and will be in control of what they're doing and not um, taken control by others. Coming back to money, uh, in terms of revenues, we've seen the, the NFT market exploding, so to say, uh, without any boundaries, just rising up, up, up. Um, just until, let's say, la last year, uh, where we've seen the, the first down pair. Another quadruple to come or in revenues, or what's your expectation there? Maybe you should ask Lucas. But <laughs> 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 no, um, <laughs> in all openness, um, if you look at the, the studies from banks or from, from market experts, they say that the um, NFT market in, in 2030 will be 211 billion USD. I frankly have no idea whether that's true or not. That would be a 30 plus percent CAGR. Um, looking at the situation we are currently in, I would say, you know, if we take the Gartner hype cycle as, an, you know, as, as a model to, to look at it, I would say we are not in the face of depression, but we are rather in the face of consolidation. You know, it was a huge hype. Now maybe we are going into a consolidation phase, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to see a very sustainable business with NFTs and in the wider area than Web3 uh, in the future to come. And you, Mike? Boom or bubble? I think uh, continue to growth, uh, continuous growth. I think, uh, like most technologies, you've got early adopters that jump in, uh, and then you have the, the phasing off, uh, and then you realize a more normal, steady state of growth, and I feel like that's where we're going to go towards. I think that there's lots of challenges, some that Luke has pointed out on, uh, us uh, making digital collectibles more complex than they need to be uh, in terms of terminology, in terms of wallets and use. Uh, I think uh, they're still quite new in terms of uh, uh, just being digital collectibles. Uh, not a lot of experience tied to it, not a lot of gamification. And so I, I think we're just very, very early. Uh, and so probably we're at this phase where we've had the, the boom, uh, we've seen a slight decline, and then we're, we're looking for what that steady uh, steady state is going to be. And is there any particular thing that you have on your digital agenda, so to say? What's what's the next thing, the next step for you and just take some insights, please? <laughs> for, for us right now, we're, we're investing uh, in exclusivity. I mean, whether it's uh, content, whether it's digital products, uh, whether it's uh, uh, behind the scenes experiences, uh, we, um, we're investing where we can provide 
uh, access and exclusivity in different ways. And so that could be uh, in the form of a, a digital video moment. Uh, it could be uh, in the form of uh, behind the scenes access uh, at our stadium or at our training facility. But we're really investing in, uh, uh, in exclusivity uh, in its simplest form uh, that we can provide to, to fans in mass ways. Lucas, uh, first of all, and I understood that um, NFT, from my perspective, started as one thing was collecting, second thing was, was trading, earning money with it. We've heard now it's usability. Do you see what's the next thing in terms of usability? What, what's the areas where we will see uh, NFTs? I know you don't like the word pretty much. Yeah, so at Pond Football, we were not allowed so to use it. So internally and externally, <laughs> because I think it's really completely nonsense, because no one understands it. So I think it's not like leveling up what you just mentioned, like we did this, this, this. We approached it from the very beginning where I said, we need to offer benefits to users and customers without making technology visible. That's the goal. And then it's about adding value and, and benefits to what you're selling. So that's why I would completely disconnect the discussion from Web 2 or Web 3 or um, offline, etc. It's building experiences which connect. Yeah? So as I said, when, when you own a digital collectible, um, which you should be proud of, you can sell it. But it also, also should give you the, the, the possibility to access. That's why we have all the relationships with the clubs. Um, and, and that's then connecting the offline world and then you have web 2 where you off obviously you know and web web 3 where you can build a profile and you can be become part of a community so i would really say it's not like okay now it's first money then it's this then it's this it's always about building a great experience and when you manage to do that with a product like a digital collectible or static collectible or whatever it is then you can build a community and you can earn money with it Talking about usability, obviously uh, we're we're um, yeah right in front of moving into this metaverse um, where where people meet digitally. Digitally, um, there are avatars meeting. Um, for me, um, I'm almost 50 years old. That sounds crazy, um, but I understand that's pretty close. Uh, What's your expectation in, in terms of timeline? When are we getting there that we're meeting digitally? I know there is Zoom and I use Zoom, obviously. Um, but like uh, real, the 3D experience, when you feel being into it, when you feel sitting into the stadium, experiencing sports as if you were there. It's already happening. I mean, look at gaming. Could Look at Fortnite, Game of Thrones. Uh, it's insane, right? So that, that's why I'm saying we're, it's not like, wow, we're doing something completely new here and let's see if that's a mass adoption. We already have a mass adoption. The question is, how are we in the position to, to bring football into the mix? Because, and that was my main thing from the very beginning when we discussed, uh, I said, football has to adopt to users and fans' needs and not the other way around. And if football remains what it is today, it will lose customers because customer mindset changes. And that's the main reason where I see a big, big risk actually for the football industry um, is that if that adoption goes slower than the user and customer adoption, then there will be less revenues and then you're in a down circle. That's why I'm saying we're already there. There are like two billion gamers. Look at the revenue numbers. I mean, look at what Microsoft bought, uh, what was it, like 25 billion uh, uh, gaming studio. It, you know, it's already happening. Uh, it's just like football is sleeping uh, and not looking at this. So, thank you very much. Key takeaway, adopt to the usability, adopt Sorry, uh, to you, the needs of the too. customer. Um, um, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.